King Queer will too. August Falcher. Welcome to Athlone Castle on the Shannon in the west of Ireland, or in the middle of Ireland, I should really say, on the Shannon. Um, you're all very welcome. My name's Dave, and I'm from a living history group called Cleave. We specialise in 16th century history, often leaking into the 17th and back to the 15th, so you could say we cover 1430 to 1660 as our main period. But we also do other periods, including the Viking Age, especially the 10th century, and the early 11th, encompassing the Battle of Clontarf. And we also have an interest, since about six years ago, in the 1916 Rising and the whole decade of centenaries. So, today we're going to look at the material culture of that time, uh, from about 100 years ago, in this, the year of the truce. So, I'm going to begin with the police force at the time. The police force at that time were known at first as the Irish Constabulary and they then got the moniker in 1867 of the Royal uh, Irish Constabulary. Um, so around the turn of the century in 1900 things were probably looking up if you were a member of that um, particular organisation and nobody could have predicted how things would have changed over the next quarter century and the traumas this organisation would have to go through. So I'm just going to talk about the uniform that they wore. Now there is some controversy and some debate as to the colour of the uniform, but the one colour that is never wrong is a very dark green colour. We see that especially in the 19th century. But there is some evidence that after 1916 in particular, that the source of the dark green dye was pretty sparse and they had to utilise other dyes, including possibly black. And um, navy uniforms are also known in collections, perhaps faded from black um, over time. So the tunic itself of the uniform was made of wool. It was usually a serge wool, which is a tough military type of wool, also known as cavalry twill. Um, sometimes uh, the Irish army would call it bull's wool. It's a similar type of material. So what you have is you have a bull's wool um, tunic or serge tunic. Uh, fine cut to it, as you can see at the back. You have a couple of belt hooks here to hold the weight of the belt and the equipment on the belt, moreover. You also have a series of buttons now. On first inspection, you might think those buttons are plastic, but you'd be wrong, because um, back in those days, the buttons for the police uniforms were made of hoof horn. The hoof horn had to be dyed black, and the horn was moisturized, and pressured and heated to bring us this shape. One of the most famous um, companies in Dublin making these buttons was a company called John Ireland, although other buttons were made in England itself. This is a close-up of one here. And on the back of the button, you might just be able to make out the mark of John Ireland. While the button was still malleable, that's when you put in your brass shank, which um, of course was used to stitch the button to the tunic itself. Smaller ones were used for the epaulettes and for the pockets, and then the front was sealed up by a, a larger version and a medium button was used for the back of the tunic. Pretty smart look overall, standing collar. Um, these tags tell us that the dating for this particular uniform is 1902 to 1922. And that's because we have what we call a king's crown. Chess players will know about that already. Um, a queen's crown is more bulbous at the top, if you take my meaning. A uh, very smart look with the red material behind it and hooked at the, at the throat to make sure the collar stands smartly. Also, you notice there's a chain here. And the chain is designed so that this small but vital piece of equipment is not lost. And that piece of equipment is a whistle. And the RIC had their own model of whistle that was made by Jay Hudson in England. <whistles> Not bad after 100 years, don't you think? So I'll put that back in the pocket. That was the policeman's, you know, that was his um, aid. That was his walkie-talkie before there was walkie-talkies to get assistance in the situation, as we say. Okay, so that's um, the tunic. Now, the policeman also wore a helmet. These fellas would have done very long shifts and um, it was important that the helmet didn't weigh too much when they were on the beat. The helmet was actually made of cork. It's covered with cloth. You have a spike at the top, decorative more than anything else. Um, and if you look closely at the very top, you'll even see some impressions of Le Ten-like Celtic art. 
this was an effort to ingratiate the police force a little more with the Irish public, although it should be noted that about 75% of these policemen were Irish Catholics. Again, you have your King's Crown on top of the harp, denoting a Royal Irish Constabulary man serving in Ireland. This piece here, strange bit of decoration, don't you think? It's actually a chin strap, which was used, of course, it was a little bit windy. So I'll just put that back and just clips in the back of the finial, okay? Now, as the 20th century moved on, as things do, fashions change, and the peat cap became more and more common, but the symbol was still, still the same, just a little smaller. And you have a chin strap here as well. Vulcanized material in this case. Of course, infamously, the RIC. Oh dear. I hope that that's in that mind. Yeah, infamously, as I said. Maybe I'll put you down there. I think that's a bit better, isn't it? Infamously, the um, RIC were backed up by a couple of auxiliary forces. First of all, the Black and Tans, who more or less would have, after you know the first few weeks, they, they would have dressed in similar uniform to the RIC themselves. And then you have the auxiliaries, the AD RIC, the auxiliary division of the RIC, um, who were notorious and still are in Irish history. They wore a Tam O'Shanter style cap, and they also had the same symbol of the harp surmounted by the crown, which was worn over the left eye. And the pattern and colour had significance behind that harp. It told you which division they were. So in other words, for this particular cap, the yellow diamond indicates a member of the Dublin division, for example. An upstanding red rectangle would be the symbol of the Monaghan division, to give another example based out of Castle Blaney. So that's the, just one of the small differences between the RIC uniform and the auxiliary division uniform, if you're interested in that kind of thing. Now, another piece of equipment I want to show you related to the RIC is the belt and the pouch. This pouch and belt here are originals from um, a context of the RIC station in Villiers Town, which is in County Waterford, and um, cuffs and pouch came together, so it was a nice find. This little locking plate here keeps the cuffs in place, and these were worn all the time when on service. Um, a snake belt that was quite like the British military belt was also worn, and the belt was adjusted by a bracer further down the side of the belt. In police service, unlike the army, the belt was dyed black, whereas in the army service, it was usually dyed brown. So that's the belt for you, and the handcuffs and pouch. We do have keys, by the way, in case there's an accident. Next up is the truncheon. We all instinctively know what this is, don't we? Now, we are in Ireland, I hasten to add, so these truncheons come not just with a sheath, but with a rain guard on top, you know, just in case it gets a bit swamped down there. You don't want your hardwood going soft. These are the type of truncheons, of course, that were used in 1913 during the lockout, which caused three deaths amongst the trade union um, people there. This one here is an interesting one. It's um, original, and if you look closely, you see a name there that maybe the man himself put. It says Crinian. So I had to do a bit of research to find out exactly who he is. The wood employed, by the way, was often exotic wood, harder than oak, and imported. Usually during um, the day shift, the RIC man would wear one of these um, on his belt, but at night time they tended to carry guns. Also during the day they could walk around on their own. At night time this was usually not the case and they usually went around in pairs for safety. There was a big difference between the two, as you can imagine. So I think that wraps us on the RIC and that's a decent enough introduction to the period. It gives us a nice bedrock to work from. Now I want to look at some of the rebel uniforms from the period. We have a few reproduction uniforms here that we've been working with, with a few original elements that we'll talk about. Okay. So the first group to talk about are the uh, Irish Citizen Army. Now, I don't know if you can see this tunic, but if you have a look at it, you can see it's a very similar colour to the dark green of the RIC uniform. Its buttons, however, are a very distinctive type of leather button, not just any leather button, 
They're a moulded Triskel button, we call them. They would be shanked with metal at the back and pressed into a mould to make the button. And usually in the Citizen Army, these buttons were dark green. Only about four or five of these original tunics survive, by the way, so they're very, very rare. Most of them were in a serge material, although I have seen tabby weave employed as well for the same purpose. So, in a way, you can see at a glance that the Citizen Army is kind of aping the police uniform, aren't they? And of course, people like Connolly, Larkin, Markovich, Captain Jack White, who ordered the first 50 or 60 uniforms from Arnott's, all these people had a certain grudge against the RIC over what happened in 1913. And this really was the signal to set up the Irish Citizen Army. It was never huge, only about 400 members at most, but they played a significant role in the Dublin Rising of 1916, nearly all of their 350 to 400 members turning out. So, man for man, the Citizen Army um, was very active. It should also be mentioned but the Citizen Army also had female members, most famous of which was Constance Markovich, of course, or Countess Markovich, as she was sometimes referred to. And in Citizen Army service, these women often wore trousers, which was not surprising for us, but back then, that was quite a radical move. So, quite an interesting army to look at. Um, the tunic, by the way, is a little bit more useful than the RIC uniform in Safari. It has four pockets at the front rather than two. So, slightly different tailoring. And, um, that's the, um, that's the ICA uniform. Just how would you know they're ICA? Well, not just in the buttons, but if you look at the shoulders, you also see ICA in a brass cipher on both the shoulders for rank and file. For Connolly and other officers like Michael Mallon, those ciphers were in italics and were on the collar instead. That's how you knew who was an officer and who was not, even though it's a socialist army, of course. All right, um, so that's the Citizen Army. just want to point out the hat as well of the Citizen Army, if I can find it. Just give me a sec. So, it's called a slouch hat. Volunteers use, use something similar. The whole inspiration came from South Africa um, with um, the Boer War. So these hats were nicknamed Cronje hats after a general in the Boer War. And the whole idea was that when you wore them, you wore left side up. And that's because the rifle drill in those days, when you shouldered rifle, meant the rifle was up on your left side, so it kept it out of the way. It also gives you a decidedly militant look, you know. Um, Dark green, of course, in, in the colour of the Citizen Army was the rig ear, and it was made of felted wool. Would have been useful to keep the sun out of your eyes, would have kept um, the rain off your shoulders as well, so a useful piece of equipment. Unlike the Irish volunteers, there was no other style of hat worn. This was it, this style of hat or the highway, you know? Um, whereas the volunteers had a couple of different styles, as we will go into in a few minutes. Now, there's often a query about the red hand insignia on the Irish Citizen Army. Why choose? you know, the symbol of Ulster or the O'Neills, whichever way you're thinking. Well, the reason was because at the time of the lockout, at the time of the lockout, um, the union used to pay its subs by means of uh, every three months. And every time you paid your subs to show you're up to date, you're given a badge with a province of Ireland on it, apparently, okay? And at the time of the lockout, when three people died, they were wearing the red hand of Ulster. And in order to remember those people, they kept the red hand forevermore, and that's the reason why, okay? Some people think it's because, you know, Margaret Skinner, the famous sniping Scot, was from Scotland, had Scottish links. Connolly himself, of course, although his parents were from Monaghan, also was brought up in, in Scotland, in Edinburgh. What a rough childhood that was. But um, that's the reason, okay? Um, it's, it, it's to do with the provinces and to do with the manner of paying subs. And uh, I, I know that, you know, because my dad worked in the Irish Transport and General Workings Union for a long time. And uh, I grew up with a red hand, so let's go that way. <laughs> okay, so that's the Citizen Army. Small, but very impactful, I, I think I, I would say. Now, the Citizen Army were, were, were formed late in 1913. First uniforms appeared in 1914. But meanwhile, there was another um, group of Irish um, free thinkers and rebels forming another organisation called the Irish Volunteers. The first meeting took place on the 23rd of November 1913 at the Rotunda building. My granddad actually went there and like many others he had to attend the meeting outside the building. It was so popularly uh, attended. Um, so the Volunteers were founded by Owen McNeil and others including Patrick Pearce, Eamon Kiant, uh, Joe Plunkett, uh, Tom Clark and people from the IRB were also involved, so it's a, basically a roll call of who's who in 1916 in some respects. Very soon after the Irish Volunteers were founded, a uniform committee was founded, led by Professor Owen McNeill, and um, 
Earl McNeill was assisted in this matter by one Lawrence Kettle, who was the first person to actually wear the uniform in public in a photograph session that took place in Harold's Cross in 1914. So I'm just going to have a look at this uniform. Um, we have a few examples of it. We have a few officer tunics here that we've used for various TV productions and museums over the years. And um, we also have, of course, um, the rank and file, which is the most important rank, in my opinion, to always show. So this tunic here is my replica of an Irish Volunteers tunic. Um, basically, I, I can't afford an original one. They go for very high prices, as you might imagine. And um, there's not very many of them around. So supply and demand, Adam Smith stuff prevails, right? So the tunic, um, the first argument basically in the committee was, was what colour would it be? And there was some debate over whether it should be grey for urban fighting. So there was some thinking in that way, all right, before the Easter Rising. Or green, of course, which of course represented Ireland. But of course was also useful colour for rural activity. In the end, they decided to go for what they called a heather green, which is kind of a greyish green colour. I don't know if you can see those very clearly, but they're on the shoulders for reinforcement, just like the British tunic would have. You have epaulettes and at the back, we'll just turn it around, take the risk, will we? Oh yeah. Why not? You have your clips, that's the um, belt up doing what it's meant to do, holding the belt up. And you have a nice uh, tailored waist, as you can see, in skirt. So that was the tunic for you. Now there was some variation. Um, the volunteers had a recommended uh, supplier of material, and that was the Murrah Brothers Mill, which was in Douglas, in, in Cork, um, very near Cork City. Uh, they were the only mill who would take on the contract because other mills in Ireland were doing so well out of British Army contracts, as you can imagine, making the khaki material for the British Army and the Irish regiments, of course, thereof. So, although that was the recommended material, many of these uniforms were sourced privately and even members of families would assist in making these uniforms. So we have a great disparity in the type of cloth used um, when we look at the examples that remain in museums today. One very good museum to go to to see this disparity is the Public Museum in Cork City at Fitzgerald Park, where they have three really good captain uniforms, really incredible stuff. Uh, highly recommend it. And of course, you have the museum in Dublin also at Collins Barracks, which also has some fantastic original examples along with some other fascinating stuff. So, this is um, Bull's Wall, and if you look closely, I don't know if you can see this with the camera, but um, if you want to do a close-up, now's the time. This is the surge material I'm talking about, okay? It's got a little stripe in it, and that's what makes it a little tougher than the usual humdrum, you know, tabby or twill, two-two twill weaves that you might have. The collar was quite high, and there's a hook at the throat to, to add to the smartness of it. If you look closely at the harps, this is another little focus point you might want to look at. The harps are much more squashed than the modern army harps, a little less crisp looking as well. Some of the harps with the original volunteers uniform do have I and V on either side of the harp, just like the modern Irish army uniform, which still pays respect to that to this day. But some of the harp buttons only have the harp without the I and the V. The I and the V, of course, stand for Irish volunteer, not for the 4th Battalion, as, as you might have guessed, and I don't blame you for that, you know. Also, you have IV on the shoulder epaulettes, for Irish Volunteer. Again, it's a bit surprising, it's not Osgwaelga, but that's the way it is. And you have a dark green epaulette here. Now, very soon after the Free State is founded, this dark green feature is dropped from the uniform, so that's one of the differences that you have with the Free State uniform. You also have a change of colour and some other tailoring differences. And the cuffs, which were originally dark green in Irish Volunteer uniforms, again, are dispensed with, with the army that comes in with the Free State after uh, the War of Independence, okay? Now we'll just have a look and see if it's interesting in these pockets, shall we? Sometimes you find something. What have we got here? Oh, this guy's an insider. Or is he an outsider? He's advertising for the Citizen Army. That's interesting, isn't it? So maybe he's got a foot in both camps, you know? Maybe he's a friend of Conley and a friend of Pierce. They're exactly the guys that we need, aren't they? What else have we got here? Fallon, so this is a great one. This is an advertisement for Fallon's, they were on Mary Street. And this is exactly the place where my own granddad bought his bits and pieces, but he couldn't afford the full uniform. He could only afford a few bits of equipment, being an ordinary working man. But you can see the way the ads are, are so useful to people like myself for reinterpreting these uniforms. You can see all the details, uh, often far better than you can see them in a photograph. Although photographs have their place too, of course. Now in terms of rank, 
This is an ordinary volunteer's uniform, but there is a caveat. See the two stripes just there over the left pocket? Two stripes tell us that we're dealing with a squad leader. In other words, a man in charge of 30 other men. Okay? If he had only one of those stripes, he'd be in charge of 10 men, what we call a section leader. So there was quite a rigorous um, ranking system within the volunteers. Um, three stripes, by the way, for the nerds who need to know these things, was the rank of adjutant. Okay? Now, all those ranks are rank and file, enlisted men type thing, you know. But what we're going to look at now is just what the officers wore. So I'm just going to pick up a few uniforms here, give you a closer look. Here we have the rank of lieutenant, okay? You have um, a single pip there and a single stripe, okay? And what that tells me is, is that we're dealing with a second lieutenant, okay? The first lieutenant would have two pips and also one stripe. So that's the difference between the two ranks of lieutenant, okay? A uh, famous example of a lieutenant of this particular rank, as in second lieutenant, was Michael Malone, who fought at the Battle of Mount Street Bridge, famously with a C-96 Mauser. And we're going to have a look at one of those in a little while. One part of Michael Malone's uniform actually survives in Collins Barracks Museum to this day. And um, it's just one of the sleeves. And it looks very like this, except instead of using the earlier metal insignia, Malone has a cloth uh, shamrock here, or cluster of shamrocks here, to indicate his rank. Now, just to tell you what a captain's rank was, if you go up a rank to captain from first lieutenant, what you're dealing with is two stripes instead, okay? So it's quite obvious when you see a captain knocking around, and he has three clusters of shamrocks. So there's a lot more clutter on the sleeve of a captain than there is on the lieutenant, okay? I'm just telling you that because um, I don't have a captain's uniform here today. Don't worry, it's in safekeeping. Now, let's move up to the higher echelons, to the famous people, you know? At the top, you had the rank commandant, okay? That's people like Thomas McDonough, Eamon Kant, Joseph Pluckens. Plunkett was um, Commandant General. Patrick Pierce was Commandant General. So that's two different ranks within Commandant, if you will. The Commandant rank had three stripes, so it's a step up from the Captain. But there was less pips usually, okay? Two pips for a standard Commandant. A Vice Commandant had one pip. Pierce himself, though, at the rank of Commandant General, would have actually had four of these stripes, believe it or not, okay? And uh, three pips. So, huge clutter if you're a Commandant General, all right? Now, what the insignia was at this rank, well, there was rules for that, but the rules weren't always obeyed. The ideal thing to have was what was called a wheeled cross. This is a wheeled cross here in fabric form, which was not the original form. The earlier forms were actually metal, but we think a blue enamel cross painted on. But this fabric cross um, was called a wheeled cross, and the inspiration for it was the Confederacy of Kilkenny, which was um, how the Gaelic Irish were led in the 1640s in the fight against the parliamentarians and against, ultimately, Cromwell. So it was an alliance of Gaelic chiefs, and perhaps whoever designed this element of the uniform was inspired by their 17th century Irish history. So that's the wheel cross, but other variations were used. And um, here you have a typical configuration. Um, I had great help setting up these uniforms with um, F. Glenn Thompson, a famous military historian who used to volunteer out of Collins Barracks back in the day. Sadly, he's no longer with us, but he gave me great help, and I'm so glad um, we had our conversations uh, back in the day. So, here you have a harp on top. Sometimes, believe it or not, the harp was actually originally an RIC harp with the crown just snapped off. Cheeky butt, three dots. And then below, just like the captains, sometimes they could use also uh, clusters of shamrocks. But there was further variations. So here's another variation for you. Here we have three stripes and three buttons instead of using you know, metal or cloth insignia. So if, if you couldn't get the insignia, of course you had to improvise, okay? So that makes sense. And this tunic here is especially made for a TV or a, a kind of a, a short film, special piece I was making with filmmaker Marcus Howard just recently in the role of Eamon Kant, and uh, Kant is seen in a photograph wearing this type of configuration, so that's interesting to see. And again, you see the type of football buttons that were used by the Irish Citizen Army, by the way. They seem to be de rigueur amongst the rebel forces, and um, somewhat amongst um, wider society too, by the way. If you're wondering, three pips and three stripes doesn't actually 
stick to the rules that the Irish volunteers put for themselves. But as Kant himself said, it was often hard to tell the rank of the man by the uniform. He told that to his interrogators after he himself was captured at the end of the rising. So that's um, the tunic for you. Um, for officers, by the way, you may also notice the trend. It wasn't a strict rule either, but normally for officers, unlike the enlisted men, it didn't button at the neck. It was an open blouse and you would see a woolen tie, nothing too shiny, you know, and a shirt. Now, for the shirt, it was recommended that you use wool or linen, maybe cotton if you have a few bob. And the shirt was recommended to be in a muted colour, browns, olive greens, greys, yellows, th th those sort of colours. But you do still see white, of course, the most common colour in those days in, in photographs also. Um, one more thing I want to point out about the uniform is the oxidisation of the buttons. There was a directive in autumn of 1915 that all the buttons had to be blackened or oxidised to darken them to avoid the attentions of enemy snipers. So although many people write off the 1916 leaders and the Irish volunteer leadership, it's been a bunch of poets and romanticists, that's a very practical precaution that they took amongst others in the lead up to the rising itself. So that's why uh, these ones have been darkened. Other ones are not so dark because when you're using the tunic a lot, it actually rubs off and you actually, you actually have to keep on top of this type of stuff. Now, headgear for the volunteers. There was two types of hats prescribed, and ideally each volunteer would buy one of each. One, the Cronje hat, a bit like the Citizen Army hat, was designed to be used for field activity or insurrection, if you like. So I would guess that most volunteers were wearing one of these during Easter week. Pierce himself did, for example. However, a peat cap was also prescribed, and um, the peat cap was designed for more official um, duties and ceremonial duties, such as, for example, O'Donovan Ross's funeral, which took place in 1915. Now, the badges on these caps varied, okay? The most common one was the harp, okay? And just like the Citizen Army, the hat was worn as so, left side up, okay? You'll often see TV programs with it worn the wrong way, but I guess some volunteers would have worn it the wrong way too, so I'm not pickling over that, you know? It's, again, it's made of felted wool and it uh, gives good protection against the elements. This one here is more modelled on the British Army cap. You've got um, a woollen peak from 1915 onwards. Before that, it was vulcanised leather, a bit like the RIC peak. And again, that was deemed too shiny. So this was another step from 14 to 15. So the uniform was continually evolving all the time. And just like the brass wear on the uniform, you had to darken the badge as well, okay? So this is the darkened badge. So I'm just gonna go through this badge with you because it's a very important symbol in Irish history. It's still the symbol of our national army today. Um, what you have is you have a brass badge with the letters FF in the center, standing for Fianna Foyle. Fianna Foyle was essentially a moniker or an alternative name for the Irish volunteers. Fianna Foyle, if you don't know, um, Fianna is warriors or soldiers and Foyle is destiny, just like the Lea Foyle. So you have warriors or soldiers of destiny. It was much later that Dev Lehrer came up with using that name for a political party, and I don't blame him. It's a fantastic bit of branding, we have to say. Um, around the FF, you have a son. And again, the son was related to the stories of the Fianna, which the volunteers took inspiration from. You have written down on the son, and inside the son, um, and between the FF symbol, Drung Ohaclea. Drung is brigade, so it's Dublin Brigade, Ochlea or Bali Ochlea was the city of Dublin. If you look closely at the sun, you can see there's eight arrows pointing outwards, a bit like a compass, and that's what I think that means, but there's no academic agreement as to exactly what that stands for. People always debate these things, but that's what I think it is. This badge was designed by Professor Owen McNeil. He wasn't just, you know, the leader of the volunteers. He was also uh, a professor of medieval history, and he is, in my opinion, what we would now call very much a graphic designer. It's a, it's a fantastic um, design, it has to be said. Just to show you how um, the badge has altered slightly over the years. I'm going to come back to you now, so never fear. The main difference is, this is the one that was used um, on the Vickers helmet. That's the one that looked a bit like a German helmet, back in the late 20s onwards, up to 41. And, um, the main difference is it grows in size after the revolutionary period. 
The modern Irish um, cap is slightly more bulbous now today, by the way. So that's how you can tell if you're looking for an original one. Or at least it's one of the things. We can't get into too much detail today. Now, originally these buttons were probably brass, but buttons, as you know, when you're milling around the place, they're going to get lost. So here we have some replacements, again, in your Triscoll uh, leather pattern, holding the chin strap in place. As I said, it was incumbent and ideal for each volunteer to have both of these hats, but in my experience and from what I hear from, you know, first-hand accounts, most volunteers could only afford the one or the other, so that was it, you know. And if you got one or the other, you were doing well, because as far as I remember, my granddad could never afford um, that element of the uniform himself. Maybe we should take a look now at what elements of the uniform my granddad could afford. So the, so the next thing I'd like to just talk about is um, the field equipment, the bits and pieces the volunteers carrying around, okay? So as you might imagine, the trousers, of course, were made of a similar um, material. Um, boots were leather for workmen, for soldiers, upper and lower. In the army, normally you would have hobnails to reinforce the sole. A heel plate was always there for officers and for rank and file. And um, leather laces were the rig ear as well. So the whole shoe is, is really it's a very bovine affair, if you want to put it that way. Um, they also wore what we call cooties. Now, the Vikings even wore a style that was similar to these. These wound up the legs and they bloused the trousers into the boots to give a tidy appearance, but also to keep you out of the entanglement and undergrowth. Um, especially if you're fighting rurally. Uh, the best way to put them on is from the bottom upwards and maybe someday I'll do a detailed talk about that by the way because it's a little study onto itself that has to be said. You'd be surprised how many people wear them the wrong way and then when they do they fall down and it never looks good you know. So these ones here are grey. The volunteers though we know used various colours. Uh, blue was another colour that's been recorded and the khaki yellow of the British Army of course was also used but ideally of course they would be green. Foxes of Dublin was one of the main companies that made the pooties. After 1916 itself, we see less and less of the woolen pooties, and we begin to see more of these ones, uh, leather gaiters. Uh, these are an older style in brown, and um, although some officers wore these probably during the Easter Rising, the pooties were probably still more common. But once we get to the period of the flying columns, the War of Independence and the Irish Civil War, IRA gunmen are frequently pictured wearing these ones in, in particular. And they clip in just underneath the leather here and um, the strap wraps right around allowing for a nice tight and close fit. There was different sizes depending on your height of course. These ones here are about 16 inches. Okay, so that's that style. Um, a more modern version also existed. There's not a huge difference but these are black ones and sometimes the RIC by the way and more especially, the auxiliaries would use gaiters like these ones here. And uh, they're slightly tidier. There's no strap going around the outside. There's a little clip there on the inside, made of metal. And you just clip it in as so, and then strap it at the top. And so it makes them a little bit quicker to put on as well. It's a little bit more convenient. And um, in World War I, various soldiers from different nations would have used these, especially cavalry. So that's uh, the gaiters for you, and the leg wear. Now, just want to talk about the bandolier, the bag, and the belt, okay? Often, for some volunteers, by the way, the belt was the only insignia they had. If you couldn't afford a hat, you didn't have the tunic, the belt was really your only insignia. But um, first of all, I just want to look at um, the bandolier. This is the earlier type of bandolier, known as the 1882 bandolier, because of its history in the British Army. And um, this bandolier was kind of an open bandolier, where you see the bullets extended out like fangs, really. These bullets are pretty big, aren't they? Well, these bullets are the type that was used with the Hoth Mauser, a gun that we're going to look at towards the end of our talk today. You can see the old-fashioned lead head stove sticking out there. And for the nerds who need to know, these bullets are 11 millimeter. Um, the bandolier, by the way, held bullets to the front and to the back. These bandoliers are fairly rare these days. And when we do find them, they're often fairly fragile. So um, we tend to use uh, replica bandoliers, kind of break them in a bit and give them a bit of oil to age them a bit to make them look a bit more like the originals. And I find that works a bit better aesthetically anyway. So that's one type of bandolier that was used, but by far the most common one, and knowing my luck, I won't probably find it now, 
Okay. I made my own mess, so it's my fault. Oh dear, there we go again. I can't even blame the wind, by the way. So. What do you do? So, yeah, as I was saying, the main type of bandolier, let's go because I found some other stuff I wanted to find as well there, by the way, was the 1903 bandolier. So the date tells it's, it's a far more modern one. Um, it's still used by reserve units and cavalry units to some extent in World War I by the British Army, by the Irish regiments thereof. Uh, it was designed to hold the uh, famous 303 round. It's um, a bullet that was used by the main British rifle. We're going to have a look at one of those rifles in a little bit. The clip is made of iron, bullet heads made of copper, the brass case made of brass. You have a few metals there. Um, each of these pouches can hold up to two clips. So with five pouches, you could hold 50 bullets. Glad I got that one right. Um, for cavalry in the British Army, there was also four pouches on the back, a variation of the bandolier. So you could carry up to 90 bullets. Um, so it's made of leather. Usually, but not always, there's a, there's a maker's mark, usually close to the uh, base here. So here we have, um, I don't know if you can read that, it's very difficult to read with the cracked letter. But um, there's a date there of 1909. So these are actually quite common on the market. And for that reason, in our group, it's actually a prescribed bit, bit of um, equipment. You have to own one of these and use one of these to be a member. Um, replicas just don't compare, to be perfectly honest, with the craftsmanship of these people from over 100 years ago. This one was made in Birmingham, but others were made in Dublin and um, other parts of Ireland also. Um, it was usually worn over the left shoulder, so I'll just show you. And so, you have a little strap here with a little button. And the idea was that when you're wearing the belt, you can strap that strap underneath the belt and it stops the whole bandolier from rotating while you're using it. Okay. Of course the bandolier was the one bit of equipment that really gave you that militant look that a lot of volunteers were probably looking for in those days and it was still used by the flying columns of course after the rising well into the civil war. However there were substitutes for this which is good for group members of Cleave as well by the way. You know, Here's one that was used um, by the British Army in World War I. It's even stamped with a date there. Look at that, BSA, Birmingham Small Arms Company, 11th of March 1917. And yes, this one did come off the set of the 1917 film. Don't know if you've seen it or not, but that was my last pre-plague film. Recommend it. It's, it's a pretty good action film, it has to be said. These ones here were pretty deluxe. They had uh, press fasteners on top, which keeps things nicely contained. And often they were used by trench raiders who required extra bullets for the job that they had to do. So that's one type, just made of cloth or canvas. After the war, it became more common to make these even cheaper. And you just have a small clip here, and a lot of um, flying column men would have had slings like this to bring additional bullets too. Okay, so that's, as you can see, very cheap to make in comparison to the leather version, as you might imagine. Um, so that's the bandoliers, that's the carriage of ammunition for the ordinary volunteer. We'll have a look at the pistols and uh, the the, the ammunition for them a bit later as well by the way so hang in there if that's what you're waiting for now the bag whether you're in the citizen army whether you're in the volunteers or whether you're in coming them on the canvas bag was very important they call these bags haversacks now i think of a haversack more as a backpack myself these days but back then haversack usually refers to a bag that's worn on usually the left hip but in, sometimes it can be worn on the right hip as well um, the bag was made of canvas, and usually the canvas was white. Of course, this was an issue in itself. Um, it was a little bit bright for combat service, so what they would do is they would usually dull the bag down on purpose using you know, dirt um, when on manoeuvres, or maybe splashes of dye, or, or whatever came to hand. Bits of oil, I suppose, could be used as well for that purpose. The bag um, is quite noticeable in period pictures because you'd see a white stripe usually going over the shoulder of the Citizen Army volunteer coming among woman, and that's what it's for. It's the strap of the bag. No Velcro or zips, of course, in those days. Velcro would have been handy, wouldn't it? Anyway, we'd have to wait for that one. But here we have um, a button, and the button here, again, is made of leather with a metal shank. And um, inside we have some volunteer items. So I thought it might be an idea that we put some of these items maybe on the grass, and I'll just talk you through a few sure. of the typical Perfect. items that the volunteer would use. That'll work. That'll work, that's great. We've got very cooperative camera people here. So I'm gonna take them out nice and slow as in not too quickly. We'll just dump them out here and see how it goes. So I'm just gonna move this camera so we can see. Yeah, just thought we'd take a look. Yeah. 
what you might find in the volunteers' bags because photographs don't give us that information. Now, that's a good spread, isn't it? Not too bad. What time were you guys? I was checking my 1916 uh, watches working. 146. 146, yeah? Yeah, just about five minutes fast. That's not bad, is it? <laughs> Considering it's 100 years. <laughs> okay. So, this is what you might find in, in the volunteers' bags. It's an army man's bag, same thing, coming them on, similar as well. Okay. So, of course, a lot of these people were Catholic, so you have your, your rosary beads. Um, gloves are important, of course, but often in the military, the gloves are very thin leather because you need to be able to do things. You need to be able to, you know, most importantly, most graphically, pull that trigger, grab that bullet. You know, you don't want to lose any seconds, but if it's freezing cold, gloves are very useful. In polite society, apparently, brown was fine for everyday use, but um, if you were being strict, black was good only for funerals, okay? So be careful of that foo pat if you end up in the wormhole 100 years ago. A comb made of wood. Um, it could have been made of plastic, you know, the early plastics like Bakelite were becoming more and more common for products such as this. But um, wood was still being used for, for such purposes. Maybe we need to go back to those materials, don't we? When we're thinking about the planet these days. Here you have a needle case. When you're stuck in an insurrection, your mammy's not with you. So you need to sew your own clothes when you get a hole in your knee, okay? So that's a needle case for you. Being a soldier, most of the time it's pretty boring. You're hanging around, doing nothing, waiting for orders, waiting for something to happen. And then for the other, you know, 2%, it's, yeah, very exhilarating, nerve-wracking, whatever, you know. Um, so in your spare time, during that 98% of the time, it's good to have a book, isn't it? The Bible, of course, gives a lot of people comfort, uh, especially in those days. But um, a lot of these people in the volunteers, and coming them on, were very interested in Irish culture, Irish history. And this book here, with the lovely harp on this is from the 19th century and it's the sort of book I imagine a volunteer to be reading and if I was a volunteer this is exactly the book I'd be reading just so you know and it's called The Life of Hugh O'Neill of Hugh O'Neill of Tyrone one of the great heroes of the 16th and 17th century Membership card, very important every member had a membership card the volunteers and this one here used to belong to Claire Arthur Audrey work. You can see that he's well signed up, so you can keep buying his books. Now, I mentioned earlier on, we're out of walkie talkies and mobile phones in those days, but one way of signalling is to use silk handkerchiefs. Famously, Elizabeth of Farrell uh, used a, a white flag to bravely walk up Merce Street to arrange the surrender for the volunteers at the end of Easter week. Um, the white, of course, is negotiation. Red could have been used, for example, to signal danger from a window to another volunteer across the street, you know? The Brits are coming around the corner. Makes sense, doesn't it? So that's what you're using. Here we have a little telescope uh, that could have been used to spot the enemy. I'm not sure how effective that is. Let me give the clean. And then a compass. It's always good to know, especially when you're in a rural area, what way north is, okay? And then you have the watch, of course. This watch actually is within the family. It's always great when you can use something that's actually yours for your work. Uh, this belonged to my mother's father and uh, still works pretty well, as you can see. So the volunteers often would have carried their watches along with, you know, civilians at the time from a pocket in their waistcoat. And um, if you have a look closely, you can see there's one um, hole there that's actually vertical rather than the horizontal buttons that retain the buttons. This um, hole is not always present in original waistcoats from the time, but that's one way to string the chain up and keep it tidy. So there you go, there's a few items from the volunteer's bag that I thought you might like to see. Um, and now we're just gonna talk about the belt buckle itself, okay? And then we'll move on to coming them on. Sound good? Perfect, we're gonna move the camera then. Yeah. This is the belt buckle of the volunteers, um, the classic one, and the one we see most frequently. It has the legend, Ogli Naheran, in Gaelic font, Beautiful, beautiful design with the harp in the centre, of course, without a crown. Uh, these people being Republicans, of course. And like any military belt, the belt is worn bloused with the front of the tunic, so it keeps a neat appearance, always important in any military organisation. Um, this belt was the second one I ever made, by the way. 
um, the first one is here. Now this first, this, this belt here is actually a rarer variation of the volunteers belt. The legend is actually written in English, it says Irish volunteers with shamrocks and you have a very nice crisp harp there in the centre. And this belt is copied from the belt that Liam Lynch wore when he was killed in the Civil War um, later on in the um, Revolutionary period. Um, his full suit of clothes, including the belt, are on display today in Collins Barracks Museum near the Croppies Acre in Dublin. Um, when I first made this belt, I counted every single stitch hole. I'm not joking, you know, this is pretty nerdy stuff, but if you want to get things right, if you only want to do things once, that's what I suggest uh, we should do, you know. So it's nice to have the two variations, and I'm sure um, volunteers individually had preferences, but maybe there was only one available in certain shops and one available in another shop along, you know, shops like Fallon's and the Limerick Clothing Factory that was based up on North Bridge Street. There were several shops selling this stuff. Hearns and Waterford, for example, was another place that supplied volunteer uniforms. And Hearns is still there. I think they sell uh, fishing tackle today. Someone from Waterford can put in the comments if they like. So, there you go. Um, just like the police belt, by the way, these belts were leather. Um, I used shoulder leather, just like the originals, which is the thickest part of the cowhide, about three to four millimetres thick. And you have the brace to one side to alter the size. But once you've altered the size, it fits you every time. Or that's the idea, at least. So, let's see if this sort of fits. Maybe, no, that, that's going to be too embarrassing. Let's not try that. <laughs> okay, so there you go. Um, these belts are replicas because, well, I wouldn't wear one if I had an original one, by the way, because they are very rare and the market value is usually something around 800 to 1200 euros or more, okay? So that's why we don't do that, okay? So that's the volunteers uniform. Let's move on to the ladies, shall we? So, come them on. Come them on were founded on the 2nd of April, 1914, shortly after the Irish volunteers. Uh, the volunteers had considered admitting women into their ranks and while the men were trying to decide this situation with their internal discussion, the women just said, sure, we'll set up our own thing while we're waiting. Yeah, it's going to take way too long. So the coming them on uniform was wool. And not very many of these uniforms survive in Irish museums, but they tell us that these women, many of them were dressmakers themselves. Um, many of them would have made their own uniform. And if they didn't make their own uniform, a close relative likely did. Unlike the Irish volunteers, there was no particular prescribed material, but all these greens were, you know, from olive green to quite bright greens, were all made of tabby, twill wools. There was a huge mix of materials, but they all looked uniform and homogenous together, and yet they all had their own uniqueness. So every common mod modern uniform that I see is a fascinating uh, thing to look at. Unlike women who served in the Irish Citizen Army, like Markovic, common the modern women uh, did wear skirts, but the prescribed skirt had to be between, had to be seven inches above the ground, which in those days was actually quite a short skirt. You know, to us that's nothing to be thinking of at all. But it may have even been, you know, somewhat scandalous to certain people. But that was, of course, to facilitate movement. The pockets on coming them on uniforms are often fairly large. You have box pockets at the top here. You have uh, larger ones at the base, and often coming them on original uniforms have hidden inside pockets for carrying around dispatches that Come Them On women did. The logo of Come Them On is seen here on the badge. Prior to 1916, and including the rising around that time, um, the badge was usually worn on the left lapel, sometimes the right lapel. Um, however, after 1916, it's more and more the case that we see the badge worn on the hat. Now, the badge was usually made of white metal, be it lead, a pewter mix, or silver, if you've got a few bob, and uh, Paul Gosling of the GMIT College in Galway has done a lot of work on these badges and it looks as though many of these badges were made by the Dundalgan Press Group in Dundalk in County Louth. So that was one of the places where a lot of these badges were made. And Paul, to the best of my memory, has come up with at least seven variations. Sometimes the rifle in the logo looks like, just like at the Enfield, very, very realistically rendered. Sometimes it looks like a 2-2 rifle, kind of a sporting rifle from the time. And sometimes it just looks like, you know, a, a generic rifle. Um, you can see, if you look closely at the logo, you can see C, Na, M, B. And of course, those are the initials of Common Na Mon, or Council of the Women, Organisation of the Women. We'll just see if there's anything in the pocket here, shall we? What do we have here? Yeah, what we might have here is a better look at the logo. That's what I'm really looking for. So this is the, the constitution of Common Na Mon. 
And that's just a slightly better look at the logo there than you can see on the badge, okay? Now, sometimes a yellow metal badge comes on the market and some of those may be authentic, but they're, they're, they're more tricky. Um, and we're not sure how many were actually issued in, in yellow metal as opposed to white metal. I'll just read you while I have it here, the objectives of coming them on. Just good to know these things, isn't it? Just to put a bit of complexion onto the artifacts. First of all, the complete separation of Ireland from all foreign power. Second, the unity of Ireland. And third, the gaidicisation of Ireland. I think that's a pretty clear set of objectives that we're still trying to achieve today, of course. Now, the buttons that come in the Mon uniform, from my experience, are normally brown, again, football buttons with this Triskel symbol on them, okay? Uh, very, very distinctive buttons. and. We, we pick these up in antique shops one by one, two by two, same with all the other uniforms. And in fact, the volunteers may have been watching Come them on and the Citizen Army, because in 1915, mm. the volunteers actually prescribed that the metal buttons they had been using should be dropped, if possible, but if, if not possible, you can oxidize them or, or paint them black. But um, if not possible, or if possible, sorry, you would replace your volunteer buttons also with football buttons, uh, to be dyed green, by the way, in that particular case, just like the Citizen Army had. Now, alongside, the tunic and the skirt of the uniform. You also had a hat, and for coming them on, before the rising, the hat was normally flat without uh, it being pinned to the left side or pinned up in any way. But after the rising, it was more common to see the hat pinned up, sometimes with the badge. So there's a change over time with the uniform in that respect. A woolen belt was also worn by the rank and file of coming them on. This woolen belt had two buttons on it as well, also usually uh, leather metal shanked buttons. And uh, this belt was called a chris, which is the old Irish Gaelic word for a belt, as you might expect. However, some women wore a leather belt. This is the typical leather belt of the World War I period. You have a cross belt and you also have a cross diagonal strap. These belts are famously known as Sam Brown belts. And the idea with the diagonal strap was that it would help to hold the weight of the equipment that you were carrying. Um, the belt in Come of the Mon was also a sign of rank. A woman wearing this belt was usually an officer, and she would have ten other women under her command, typically Rose McNamara serving with Con Colbert. Um, with the 4th Battalion is one example of such a woman. Apparently she left um, her fastness during Easter week on the Wednesday and came back with a cow. When I look at these uniforms and see how small these women were and what they achieved, um, it really takes your breath away. Incredible stories. Now another thing we often see with coming them on women, and sometimes also with the men, but um, more specifically with the women, is a Tara brooch. So, here we have a Tara brooch. Now, these brooches were typically worn by members of Cunnera na Gaelga, the Gaelic League. And um, in this case, um, so people, yeah, women that come them on were often by default, also members of the Gaelic League, as you might expect. The Gaelic League promoted Irish culture, the Changa, the language, the Gaelic games, your hurling, your football, your camogie. They also, of course, champions the mythology and the history of Ireland. So this symbol here is more what I would think of as a cultural symbol rather than an overtly political symbol. It's a fidelity to our tour, to the culture. Okay. So that's um, the Come the Mall uniform. Again, you have the, um, the canvas bag, just like the volunteers. And in this bag we have some medical dressings, for example. And um, another thing that women and men both carried, because you have to have it, we all need it, is water, water bottles. This one here is a more old-fashioned design, made of leather, but lined with beeswax. You can't use it for whiskey, strong alcohol will melt the wax, and you can't use it for hot drinks either. But um, for water, it was very, very useful. Um, a small costal with um, a wood plug at the top. This one here is a more um, typical style though, used by coming them on and the volunteers. It's round, it's made of metal. The metal, of course, would shine in the sun, so it was necessary to cover it either with woven material or with leather, as in this case. Screw tops are quite rare in these canteens, so we often just see um, a leather cork, but there is a chain attached, so it's not lost. Um, shirts for coming them on and photographs are often white, but again, many coming them on women would have chosen a duller colour to use, and you can see here, the type of tie that was worn both by Irish volunteer officers and by the Come of the Mon membership. So that's uh, Come of the Mon. Just lay her back. And let's look at some of the other um, materials um, at this table then, shall we? Yep, we'll move the cameras. Yep. Okay, 
So I'm just going to show you a little bit more insignia. Then we're going to look at some craftsman's tools. Then we'll move on to British Army after some domestic items and then we'll finish with the weapons. Okay. So just looking at some of the insignia here, we're looking at some of the small pieces here at the front of the table. These are three examples of the Dublin badge. One of them has been blackened with paint. This one has been oxidized, so it's kind of given a, a greenish color that you might see, you know, in a bronze public sculpture, with a bit of weathering. Um, but there was some other variations. Now, outside of Dublin, most volunteers wore their plain harp. They weren't gonna wear, obviously, the, the Dublin badge um, for the first few years, although the Dublin badge did eventually develop into the national badge. And from 1917, it had the legend, Ogley na Heron, which, of course, the Irish Army still has today, soldiers of Ireland, warriors of Ireland. But outside um, of Dublin, there's, there appears to have been a few experimental attempts by various counties um, to try other badges and other symbols for the volunteers. So, for example, just next here to the Come the Mon badge, we have this one here. Now, as an archaeologist and a historian, it's great to see a badge like this because this is the Mayo badge and this symbolises the Cross of Con. The Cross of Con is one of the most famous and, um, you know, priceless artifacts we have in the National Museum in Kildare Street today, um, dating from the mid-medieval period. It also features a sun and you can see the cross there in the centre. So that's one of the variations that we think was used. Tipperary, not to be outdone, they had an even larger badge as you can see. You still have FF in the middle there, but you have Drung Brigade Tibrod Aran, which is Tipperary, and again you have an attempt here to blacken the badge, but there's clearly been some wear here Revealing some of the brass underneath, but they Obviously have you know treated this badge since October 1915 for example This one here we don't have any evidence that it was actually used But it was certainly designed and it's from County Clare and County Clare of course has proud associations with Brian Boru and the Viking Age Brian Boru probably the most famous high king in Irish history um, his clan was the Dal Gash, and Dal Gash is even written on the badge here. The two axes perhaps symbolise the Viking wars that Brian Brew was involved in. He scored many victories over the Vikings, including Sulcoit, Glenamama, and most notably Clontarf in 1014, where he lost his own life. The crown on top, of course, is a symbol of kingship in itself. The O'Briens, along with the O'Connors, were one of the very few Irish families to hold the Ard ship at Tara in historic times, besides the O'Neill family who held it most of the time between the Northern O'Neill in the north and the Southern O'Neills who were based around, of course, West Meath and County Meath. So that's one of the most interesting badges, even if it wasn't used much. The Limerick badge also uh, was a thing, and we think this was actually used. You have two axes. Again, you have Viking origins in Limerick, so that could be something there, or could be representative of the pike, of course, in 1798. You also have um, a turret symbolising the castle, King John's Castle. Today is one of the most, you know, one of the finest castles um, still standing today, and there's a fine interpretation centre there. So that's the Limerick badge, quite a small, tasteful little one. The most unusual looking one is the cork badge. It just shows a halberd head, poleaxe head. You know, you couldn't even interpret it as looking back, you know, beyond this style of axe head to the Viking Age as well, um, when Cork was ruled by the powerful Ogonoct family, who changed their brand name later on, by the way, to McCarthy, in case you're wondering where they went. Brand name changes are sometimes necessary. So that's uh, just some variations I taught people around the country or people, you know, in the US who have ancestry in those parts of the country might be interested in hearing about. So, just going to move on. Um, one of the crafts I'm involved in that I like to you know, demonstrate for the public sometimes is the craft of leather work. And often when we get these old artifacts, we need to treat the leather. We might need to do a small restoration work to maintain the leather. Other items, such as the belts, for example, are made from scratch. You know, I buy the bucket from a friend of mine in Cork, and uh, the rest of the work is done in-house um, by us guys in Cleve. So I just want to show you some of the, some of the um, traditional tools that were used in the leather work. One of the things you may have noticed on the, um, the bandolier earlier on was that at the back of it, well maybe you didn't notice because I probably didn't show you by the way, is these little rivets with round washers. They are copper, they've blackened over the years of course. So you would buy those washers in small packs, this is, in, this is an old box of them. And inside that's what they look like when they're fresh. You, so the more handling you do, the more, well, 1916 you do, the more those washers will blacken with time and age. 
which I actually prefer myself, but that's just me. Um, another tool that was important for the leather worker was the awl. Now I, I, I brought a few awls with me. Um, this type of awl, for example, was designed to um, make stitch holes in the leather. So this is the one I would use the most. But there is occasions where you want to make the hole in the leather bigger if you need to make, say, a pinhole for a leather belt, such as this one here with four sides. This one here, again, can make the hole bigger again. So I, I would use all three of these at different times. Um, the handles of these, by the way, are of a style that go back to the Viking Age. Archaeologists in Novgorod in Russia have found handles quite like these in an octagonal shape. I, I quite like the shape of these because it's, it's a really good grip, so it's very practical from a modern point of view. So I don't actually use any modern awls at all, really. There was a special type of awl that shoemakers used, and this type of awl has kind of a curved head, and it was designed to cut in, if you can imagine, the thick side of the leather, and it was designed then to pierce through either the front or the back of the leather. This was designed for the welt of a shoe when the shoemaker was adding the sole. So there's quite a lot of work and skill involved in that type of work. In order to mark out the stitches, we have a pricker wheel here. So you can see those spikes there. They would make a mark on the leather. And that looks pretty dense, doesn't it? But don't forget, you don't have to use every single hole. You can jump every second hole if you so please. So quite an adaptable uh, tool. This one here is a shoemaker's knife, and I use it for all sorts of leather work. You've got to keep it razor sharp. It's got a nice curved edge, and it's great for cutting the leather out. Um, of course, you would need um, a base plate for doing that. This is a, this is a slab of oak that I use. Uh, when I'm working in public, I just put it on my lap when I don't actually have my work table with me. Some great advice from an old friend of mine called John Nicol there. Um, I'd also like to point out this little piece here. You often see um, a bit of decoration on the belt. Do you see that little groove there on the belt? On the edge? Well, that's the tool that makes that mark. While the leather's wet, and when the leather dries out, it holds that mark. It's just a bit of decoration. It just adds to the finish of the product, you know? And just as now, the leather workers were, were proud of their working output. Like our volunteer, it's necessary to have a batch of needles for your work, of course. Uh, leather working needles are usually a bit heavier. These are some I just got in from Germany last week. So let's put them back into the case. I love this case. It's made of oak. You know, cost me a fiver in an antique shop, you know? And uh, what a beautiful little thing, you know? What, what, what people would call an art crafts kind of a style. But um, a lovely thing that you would have seen in the household um, over 100 years ago. Beeswax is really important as well for the leather worker and even for people sewing linen shirts. The linen thread, although it was very strong, would often degrade over time, especially with moisture and damp. So it was also useful to beeswax the leather. Now you just run the thread over the beeswax and that would give it a coating, a protective coating to keep it going for you. Uh, the beeswax also would stop the leather from bunching up and getting knotted while you're working the leather. I'm sure everyone who does hand stitching knows exactly what I'm talking about. So that's um, your, work, your, your leather working tools. Um, also, of course, with the rivets, you'd need a hammer and a peening hammer is what you use for that. You need a curved surface to spread the copper out and that will hold your rivet fast in place. Maybe someday we'll do a demonstration for you. Oh, one more thing. This is the third hand of the leather worker or the harness maker in particular. What's going on here is, this is made of beech wood, two, two sets of clams they're called. A little bit of pine there just to give it a bit of height. When you're sitting down, you'd have that between your legs and basically this would hold the two pieces of leather that you're stitching together, okay, in a nice neat line. You would have your old holes and then you'd be stitching. When you stitch leather, to keep it really, really tight, what you need to do is you need to use two needles at the same time. You're kind of working in and out with both hands, like a figure of eight all the way up. So that's why you need that third hand to give you the best quality finish. So there's um, the clams, in case you're wondering what it was. I bet you were. Gladstone bag, typical bag, could be used by a schoolmaster, could be used by a doctor, could be used by a come the mon woman for carrying a few pistols for us. So it's made of leather, named after the famous British Prime Minister, of course, and um, there's two locks on each side as well. So it's amazing how well this still works. It's probably, you know, well over 100 years old at this stage. And not a sign of rotten it either, so maybe my, my house is not as bad as I thought it was. Um, just want to show you some clothes from the time. Obviously, after the 1916 Rising, it was very difficult to wear, you know, an insurgent uniform afterwards, and indeed it was prohibited by law. So, although uniforms were kept, often in your wardrobe, or maybe kept for your wedding day, like Dan Breen or others have done, um, or Dan Breen's best man, I should say, um, 
what you did was that you wore civilian clothes. Don't want to draw attention to yourself. Think about Michael Collins on his bicycle, you know, going where he wanted to go in plain sight in those days. So the typical clothes worn by the volunteer would have been similar to what I'm wearing myself today. You, you might have the addition of a sports jacket on, on a cooler day, uh, made of tweed. There's not much change in these and they're still worn today, of course. Loose fabric, usually cotton or linen, sometimes wool as well. Often they were white, but um, blue and green stripes, black stripes were also quite common, sometimes red stripes even. Um, the shirt was kept tidy, along with the braces that held up the trousers by the waistcoat. Um, waistcoats in those days often had collars on them. The collars are slowly falling out of use. You can see some thin uh, stripes there as well. Um, there's six buttons there, so it buttons a bit higher than a modern waistcoat usually does. Not really that shawl effect you're going to have if you're going you know, for dinner. Um, four pockets on these earlier ones um, with a trend for two pockets coming in as well at this time so there's all sorts of materials sometimes you have a silk back sometimes the material at the back is quite similar you have a strap at the back just like a modern waistcoat to keep it tight and um, the pockets of course were, were useful for various small things like loose change and the watch as previously described the waistcoat was short and one of the reasons for that is because it was still the trend to wear very high waisted trousers uh, the trousers are often made of wool. These trousers I'm wearing today, stripe type, were considered suitable for morning formal wear. Um, so, but you could also wear them in more casual circumstances. Shoes were often very plain if you weren't wearing boots. Um, and that's why you had high trousers. You know, decency is necessary of course as well. S belts were not used all that often in civilian wear in those days. It was more common to wear braces and indeed they do keep the trousers up hell of a lot better. You can just see the leather tabs at the bottom there and you can see a bit of the brace uh, poking out there from my shoulder. Maybe you shouldn't be doing that. Um, in more formal occasions these shirts were still used but with the addition of a collar. Collars often had pointed tabs in those days. That was coming in all right but you still had rounded uh, tabs. Just look at any picture of James Connolly in civilian clothing and you'll see that. Also you had winged collars for dinner wear. Sometimes still used today. Very, very dashing looking. And then there was a standing collar known as the Imperial Collar. Probably a type of collar that wasn't all that favoured by Republicans, it would have to be said. So, the reason, one of the reasons that the collars were kept separate as well was that you could keep them clean. They were usually starched to give them their stiff appearance. And um, you might change the collar every day, but you might not necessarily change the shirt itself. All right? So that's a, a note and close. Just a little bit more on trousers. These are a pair of typical volunteers trousers. These ones have belt loops, so again, there was some lower trousers worn. Sometimes there was a back pocket, but back pockets are quite rare, and they're not stitched on like they are with you know, a pair of jeans these days. They're usually an insert uh, pocket. This one here has a closure here with a, with a leather button, as you can see. The fly is still buttons as well, by the way, and, and that's also leather. So these might be the old uniform trousers of a volunteer, but because it's not you know, recognizable as uniform, Trousers like these may still have been worn um, in the period when the flying columns were most active. However, if I was um, a flying column man, the trousers I'd be looking for would be a pair of these. These are called Jotfers, and they were basically the sporting trousers of the age. Tracksuit bottoms, but smarter if you want to put it that way. Worn by cavalry, um, they had a reinforcement here inside the leg, as you might imagine, and they were made of cord. This, this cord here is Bedford cord. Now, the biggest producer of cord and cotton in this part of the world in those days was Manchester. It was actually nicknamed Cottonopolis, can you believe, as a result. Just like um, linen was famous with Belfast, linen was also um, associated with Belfast and um, Belfast had a nickname of Linenopolis. So, so endemic was the Manchester name in cord, by the way, that German soldiers fighting in the Imperial Army in World War I who wore Manchester sometimes when their Felgrau trousers wore out called them Manchesters. So I think that says a lot. Like um, my trousers here, they're high-waisted with slash pockets at the front and um, no pockets at the rear. This particular pair are the type worn by light Australian horsemen in World War I, but they're certainly a type that any you know IRA man uh, would have been glad to have. British Army officer trousers were not too uh, different either. Just like normal trousers, they would blouse into the gaiters or into the putees. So there you go. The bagginess at the top, of course, was what gave you that freedom of movement. Um, I know a lot of guys who actually use this style of trouser for fencing, for, for sword fighting, and 
looks a lot better than a pair of tracksuits if you ask me. So there you go, that's um, the clothing. Let's look, just look at a few little, you know, things that people use in daily life, okay? Um, I, I like, I like um, items that are related to optics myself. Here's a magnifying glass, maybe a volunteer would have kept one of these, you know, to help start a fire. They're not, you know, more than one use, right? Um, very useful for me, by the way, my eyesight is fading badly these days, so now I can see the maker's marks a bit better when I'm using this. But jewellers had a specialised piece of equipment that they used for seeing the marks on jewellery, especially for, you know, silver and gold and, and pieces with hallmarks. The way you wear it, it's called, um, it's called a loop, by the way, this one's French very early 20th century and you can expand it to make it more powerful it's made of brass um, two lenses of course and you look at this through your stronger eye and that's how you wore it you may think you wear it the other way but it's actually worn this way so it's actually quite comfortable so someday I'm going to attach this to a leather eye patch and go full steampunk but what am I talking about that for? we're on 1916 stuff here aren't we? so I'm just going to give you an example of how useful these loops are okay this, well, you might wonder what it is, mightn't you? It's actually a little pen. So let's have a look at it first. Here we have a little retractable nib. In those days, there's no fountain pens. What you're dealing with is, is a dip pen. You dip it into the inkwell to use it, and that's how you write. But this is probably a pen used by a traveler, and quite a wealthy traveler. It's made of silver. So you can retract it, put it in your pocket. No harm done, right? Just make sure that nib is dry, I think. On the other side, however, there's also another sliding retractable piece. That's actually a pencil, can you believe? It's a very useful little item, isn't it? Very small, very tidy. And at the top we have a screw top. And the screw top is for, I'm not going to take them out because I'm going to lose them, but it is for pencil leads. So you've got your ammunition there as well, okay, for your pencil. So I'm just going to put that back on again. And you're not going to see the maker's mark on this or the hallmark. But I'm just going to see if I can find it. Oh, my eyes are rubbish, I'm telling you. There it is. So it's just there at the very end of the pen. This is what we call a hallmark, okay? And since the 18th century, silver is marked in this way to date it, to tell you where it's from, to tell you the maker. So there's a lot of information on that, on that tiny little hallmark that, I mean, you're not gonna see that, but. We might do a close up and- That's what we might do. Later. Let's do that, yeah, that'd be great. We'll get the macro lens in later on, guys, okay? And maybe we'll, we'll slot that in for the um, recorded version. So, I'm going to put that down now and just explain to you what marks are on this one, if I can remember them. First up, it's FW, Francis Webb. Next up, there's an anchor. The anchor tells the, um, the interested party, shall we say, the silver collector, um, that the, the city of manufacture is Birmingham. Great stuff, isn't it? This is pure detective stuff, isn't it? And the next tiny little thing that you can't see with your naked eye, well, I can't see it with my naked eye, maybe you can, is a lion. And the lion tells us that we're dealing with 0.925 sterling silver. It's not fantastic, you know? So now you know what to look out for. Look out for a lion in particular. There's also a little minuscule B letter at the very end of the cipher. And the B letter uh, tells us that the year of manufacture is 1901. Isn't that beautiful? What a fantastic little item and what a fantastic little story. So I like to think when I have this um, pen in my handling collection, that we're dealing with someone with a few bob, you know. I'm thinking about the maybe the Gore Booth family up in Sligo, you know. I'm, I'm thinking about our friend Countess Markovic once again. But who knows? Maybe some other lucky devil had one too. So there you go, it's a pen. Now, for ordinary folk like ourselves, or like me anyway, this is the sort of pen I'd probably have. Again, it's a dip pen though, so you don't have the convenience of having that fountain. So you got to keep dipping this, you know, after every couple of letters. And this one's just made of wood and uh, you can get alternate nibs and, and replace them when they wore out because they would splay. This is a spoon and it's not plastic as you can probably tell it's made of horn and when the 1916 leaders were in Kilmainham jail they weren't given metal cutlery for their last couple of meals they were given a spoon like this and uh, you can see one just like it in the Kilmainham Museum in Dublin and uh, reason being of course self damage they didn't want that going on with the prisoners of course that was probably furthest from many of these prisoners minds but the British authorities of course had to ensure that there was no problems in inverted commas so that's a spoon and uh, if you want to make a spoon like this get mammy and daddy to help you I'm just thinking because you need to heat the horn uh, you need to um, maybe use the steam from your kettle 
makes the horn very, very malleable after you've put the thing into place. And then you can press the dish part of the spoon out. And when you leave it to dry, you'll have a fine spoon. So that was plastic before there was plastic, before there was even Bakelite or the other materials. This is a clothes brush, often needed after a night in the hills. Um, another thing that the volunteer used was, and it's so iconic, ask the wolf tones about this one, is the coat. This is the trench coat that was worn by many of the volunteers. And these coats were early, in early days made of linen, waxed with fish oil. The fish oil is quite smelly and you can turn the linen yellow. So over time they started to use other oils, such as cooper oil. This one here is um, of brown cotton. So cotton came into more and more common use later on as we move into our period. And here's another waistcoat here. In this case, the buttons are covered with cloth. They're probably metal underneath and the cloth matches the material of the waistcoat. Also very common and popularised by a certain TV programme we don't need to mention is the new spy cap, also made of wool. And this was normally worn by the lower or the working classes, but um, sometimes it was also used, of course, um, in sporting wear by the gentry. Put that back up. Apparently, by the way, talking of gentry, um, down on Savile Row in the old London town, as Philo might say. Apparently there was three buttons on the cuff for um, an officer and four for a gentleman, so I don't know what sort of guy we're dealing with here. Here we have a padlock. It's got that kind of symbol of the Isle of Man, doesn't it? Three little legs splaying out. Um, I like this because it reminds me of the close connection Dublin had with the Isle of Man in the Viking Age in particular. Lots of great history there, if you ever want to pursue it. So now we're going to move on to the final section of our talk, which is going to concentrate on the Irish regiments in the British Army and the British regiments who participated in the Easter Rising. And then we're going to look at all of these weapons. Right, so. Ah, a couple more domestic items, just make it really fast, don't worry. Bottle of gin, German. Bottle in ceramic from Belfast. Beer, ginger ale. This reminds me of Sean McDiarmid, who worked up there. He was from Leitrim originally, of course, but that's where he, well, he initially got sacked from his tram job for smoking, by the way, but he ends up working in the bar. Met Bulmer Hobson, was introduced to Tom Clark, and the rest, as they say, is history. So I just like this bottle for that reason. This one here is more local to me. I, I live, um, well, close enough to Loch Ray. Those days when that seal is on top. And if you look very close there, you'll see the letters SE, standing for Ser Stolk na Heron, or the Free State of Ireland. So it dates from the 1920s. Just a little leisure thing there, skipping rope. As you will know, it's important to exercise if you want to look the best in your living history uniform. So, a bit of skipping on the sides, no harm. I'm more of a boxer myself. So, just looking at some of the insignia of the uh, British Army. The British Army is divided into regiments. Many of these regiments, well, all these regiments were, were really based on geographical origins. So, what we have here is two of the most important regiments, the insignia that was used in the Easter Rising. So, we have not some Derby here. These are shoulder ciphers, a bit like the way ICA was on the shoulders of the Citizen Army or IV on the volunteers. You have Not some Derby on this particular regiment. They played the biggest role in the Easter Rising. They were the ones who lost over 200 of their people on Mount Street Bridge to Michael Malone and James Grace in that ambush, you know, done by the um, by elements of the Third Battalion. This was their cap badge. There is, of course, a connection with Sherwood Forrester, Forrest, Robin Hood, all that stuff. So you have the deer there and the, the wreath. You have a crown on top, a king's crown, and that little slot there is designed to clip the badge into the cap. So that was worn on the cap. Um, the Knots and Derby Regiment, maybe because they suffered so many casualties, and um, for other reasons, they were the ones who actually carried out the executions of the 14 of the 16 men who were executed at Kilmainham Jail between the 3rd of May and the 12th of May 1916. So. That was their odious task. One of them, apparently, by the way, was mortified. He was a trade union man. He'd been in the mines in Wales 
and uh, he actually went up to see Connolly's widow afterwards to apologise for his part in James Connolly's execution. So, of course, there was a human face behind all these things. The rank chevrons here are the rank of corporal. Um, one stripe would be lance corporal, for example, three would be sergeant. And we also have here the South Staffordshire Regiment. The South Staffordshire Regiment are reviled in history far more than the Notts and Derby Regiment because they're the ones who committed the atrocities on North King Street. So that's another story, I guess. But suffice to say that um, civilians were caught up and the Staffordshire Regiment were frustrated by the actions of the 1st Battalion and broke into houses and executed um, ordinary, you know, neutral civilians in their own basements. Um, this badge here is an Irish regiment, so of course many Irish men fought in World War I and um, this one here is the Munster Fusiliers, a famous regiment. There's a tiger in their symbol and uh, the tiger is a reference to their service in India. So it's all about the zoo, isn't it? At the end of the day. This one here, it's also a fuse as you can see. And it says they're Royal Dublin Fusiliers, and they, of course, actually took part in the Easter Rising. So there was Irish men on both sides, in other words. And again, you have the tiger and, and uh, the elephant, I think, is there. And uh, again, that's a reference to service in India, which was a very important uh, colony to the Empire, along with ourselves, of course. This one here is from further north, from Enniskillen, or the Enniskillen uh, Fusiliers, and the famous. World War I poet Francis Ledwidge was a member of them, a very good friend of signatory Thomas McDonough. And um, Ledwidge was killed in action in 1917, but apparently he was so distraught to hear of McDonough's execution that he wept. So it just shows that we must approach history with nuance and understand that there was many opinions, not just the black and white ones that we hear more of. So I'd like to point out some of the other British equipment that I find interesting. This is um, a fine example of an original British Tommy helmet. They're known as the Brodie helmets after their inventor. And um, it's got a really good dull finish. Um, matte paint, there's grit as well to make it less reflective. Um, some of the interior still survives, it's not fully intact. The, the chin strap is missing for example. Well, a really nice dull example, that's the sort of example I want to see if I'm going to be diving in, into a trench. It was modelled on earlier helmets from medieval times, uh, including the Marion, the uh, Pikeman's Pot from the 17th century, and later on the Secret Helmet, which was a small little helmet worn under a floppy hat at the Battle of Ockram down the road here in 1691. Helmets weren't used much after Ockram in Ireland, and, um, but the artillery and the damage done to men's heads in particular, who were in trenches, um, that caused a return to the metal helmet and interestingly enough the only periods of history that I'm interested in are, are helmet periods so I don't really do the 18th to 19th century strangely enough. So there you go, lovely piece of equipment anyway and quite plentiful on the market by the way if you're looking to get one. The soft hat though was worn more often as I said um, and initially these soft hats like the volunteers had a wire in it to keep it, you know, give it some formality and stiffness but it was found that after the first year of the war or so that this was bad because um, Veterans would take the wire out, giving it the hat a more floppy appearance. And apparently even new recruits then, they didn't put the wire in because it was better for morale, that they all felt like, yeah, among the boys, you know. So that's how that went down. Later on, these hats were dispensed with, and although the difference is subtle, trench caps came in. Trench caps are altogether more floppy, and they're far better in a way, because you can squash them up and stick them in your bag and not worry about it. And when you put it back out again, it's not going to look any worse, let's put it that way, okay? It was made of metal, blue enameled, but also covered in carpet cloth to uh, protect that from reflection as well. The whole idea with the weight was to distribute it from the two shoulders. A broad belt um, retained everything from the front. To the right we have um, a helve head. This is like what we would call maybe a, a, a pickaxe head. Take a close look at that symbol there guys. It says 1914 doesn't it? And there's a little arrow. Now that little arrow is the same arrow that we see in Ireland. Um, at permanent grid markers. When the British Army was first mapping Ireland for the first Ordnance Survey, they left these marks showing where the levels were above sea level. Incredible stuff really, you know, and we still use those levels as archaeologists today to get our TBMs or temporary benchmarks from. So it's incredible. Usually if you see that symbol, it's, it's, it's a sign the British Army were here. <laughs> How's that sound? 1914. Now you also had a separate piece, just a sticker looks like, doesn't it? 
but that's how the pick worked. The two parts were carried separately and you put them together when you were digging your foxhole. Let's hope you never have to do that under pressure. This sheet here is for the bayonet, more of in a few minutes. And um, you also have what's called a mess tin. The mess tin was made of aluminium. You could cook in it, you could eat out of it, have your soup, have your gruel. Let's hope it's a bit better than gruel. And that was buttoned up there with a small brass button. Um, a small bag that could carry some small items for you also. So all the canvas was pasted with a special compound called Blanco and although the canvas was yellow, a dirty yellow colour, what the Germans might call Dunkelgelb, it was pasted with this greyish paste which gave a kind of a colour that was kind of in between and of course it would wear off and British soldiers in their spare time were constantly asked to Blanco their equipment to give an even finish. Um, in World War I that was the only colour for Blanco but in World War II several other colours appeared and the Free State Army actually Blancoed or coloured their webbing which was similar uh, in black later on from 1924 or so onwards. So there you go, that's the, the big lump out of the way, you'd be glad to hear. Braces. The standard British Army braces um, were white with leather tabs, quite typical for the time but Unfortunately, they weren't elasticated, so they're quite difficult to wear and weren't as useful as you might think. So often I think civilian braces may have been acquired by our soldiers and that might have been one of the most frequent requests from soldiers at the front right back home. Here we have one of my favourite bits of equipment that would have been worn you know, by British soldiers like the Essex Regiment in Ireland during the Civil War, or the War of Independence rather. And perhaps the Black and Tans and the Auxiliaries at times. It's just them. Um, Deerskin jacket. In World War I, they had leather buttons down the front. In World War II, they tend to be made of Bakelite, which was um, the first fully synthetic plastic we have. Um, the buttons are usually shanked at the back, which is to say they're not stitched in, but um, a leather cord or a linen cord would hold the buttons in place so they could be quickly replaced if required. Or if you wanted to put regimental buttons, regimental specific buttons in, you could do that quite fast. So fantastic piece of equipment lined with wool to keep you warm and I'm pretty sure any Germans or Austrian Hungarians who get their hands on these would, 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 wouldn't um, you know, turn their noses up at them. One more thing that's very iconic about World War I and this is not really something for our situation here in Ireland was the gas mask and this is the small box respirator as it was known and that's the box there, that's the filter and then you had your mask, excellent for Halloween I may add. The box itself was worn at the front of the soldier and um, it could be quickly released so the soldier could use it. Note, of course, that some of these gases weren't always visible so there was often a panic getting them together so it's better just to wear it on your front at all times. The string here looks like decoration, you know, for Tom Hanks and Spielberg to make things look good but it's actually there so you can tie the rest paper bag around your back because you're going to be, you know, World War One. you're on your belly a lot of the time, aren't you? And you don't want this thing traipsing you up. So that's it, that's the, um, the gas mask, very iconic from World War I, and maybe if we do a World War I talk specifically, we'll, we'll go we'll do a deep dive on that, you know. But for now, I think we'll wrap up by looking at some of the weapons used um, during the War of Independence, the Civil War, and of course the Easter Rising. So, I'm going to start by talking about artillery. We're then going to move into rifles, and then we'll have a look at some of the pistols and whatever else I see on the table, basically. I mean, what else can we do? <laughs> So, first up, it's an artillery piece and this always reminds me of that loan because in Easter week 1916, after the British authorities realised what on earth was going on, on Tuesday they ordered up four heavy field guns. These guns were called 18 pounders because of the weight of the shell they used to Dublin uh, to be deployed. They were the only four um, of these 18 pounder guns in Ireland by the way. They were put in that loan because as you may know, that loan is bank centre in the middle of Ireland so they can be deployed, you know, with relative ease to any part of Ireland. And by Tuesday, two of them were deployed on Tara Street and were used to shell the TPO and its garrison. Um, two more also were used on the north side also, and some of them were used also to shell the Liberty Hall. Liberty Hall, James Candy in the Irish Citizen Army's headquarters, alongside the Helga, which had a 12 pounder gun, a much lighter gun, than that, which less impact now. Ideally, the British Army would have wanted to have used HE or high explosive shells. These shells are denoted by green markings, okay? But we didn't have any of those 
in Ireland and stock at that time. Um, so what the British Army only had was shrapnel shells. These shrapnel shells are anti-personnel. What you have is, you have a shell casing here, filled with cordite powder, that's the modern gunpowder of the time. You have um, the top here, put it red and black to signify a shrapnel by the way, that's filled with 364 steel, sorry not steel, but lead balls, okay? So you can imagine the damage that something this would have done if it landed in a trench. You know, just one of these would cause colossal damage. At the top here, you have um, the detonator and fuse, okay? So, or the fuse rather was at the bottom, and the detonator at the top. So it's quite a piece. Um, when it was filled with powder and filled with um, the lead balls, it would have weighed about half the weight of the shell altogether, about nine pounds altogether. Um, of, of balls were in the shell, I mean to say. So it was 18 pounds altogether, I think 18.4 if you've been very detailed on it. So that's a very significant weapon used um, in the Easter Rising. And I don't have the gun to go with it and I never will, I'm glad to say, because the logistics with this stuff is hard enough. Next thing I want to show you, it's just this mug I've been drinking out of, okay? The trenches in World War One were miserable, you know? Um, you know, the rats, the disease, trench foot, all that stuff. Um, any attempt to give civility to soldiers was made if possible. And so, for example, this is just a, a steel cup, but it's painted in a homely way to make it look more, you know, think of home, remember what you're fighting for. So it's painted white and blue. It's look more like ceramic, I guess. Um, that type of cup was still used in World War II, by the way, except midway through World War II, they started to paint them brown. That's the main difference between the two World Wars. So you can count that as bonus material that you've learned there. So let's look at some of the rifles, okay? Two main rifles come to mind when I think of the Easter Rising. Um, you have the Holt Mauser and you have the Lee Enfield rifle. Now many of the volunteers didn't have either rifle, they just had shotguns uh, and sporting guns, two twos and, and, and such. This rifle here is one of the most famous and iconic weapons in Irish history. I just want to show you a nice close shot here because this is how you recognise it. You see that gothic writing just there? That's a German font as you might imagine and that font tells us that we're dealing with an IG mod 71 which is infantry Gewehr, Gewehr being rifle or weapon mod model just like English 71 1871 is the year of you know its first publication shall we say now it was designed to be used in the old Franco-Prussian war these weapons were never quite ready in time for the Imperial Army for that particular exercise uh, the Franco war wrapped up favorably for Prussia and Germany, of course, as history tells us. And the Germans upgraded their rifles several times before the time of World War I. So this was an obsolete weapon in German stocks. Famously, 900 of them were landed at Hope in 1914. And a further 600 were landed, less famously, at Kilkul by night. Um, so there's 1,500 of these Hoth Mausers altogether, alongside 49,000 49, rounds of ammunition which by the way is not a hell of a lot for all those rifles. Um, unfortunately, some of the ammunition had to be jettisoned by one of the boats on the way over. Um, they were having some stability issues. So that was the issue there. Um, more ammunition for these rifles did arrive with the odd, but as we know, the odd never landed. So there was an attempt to, to send more ammunition over. The strap on this rifle is not the one you would expect to see in a normal German rifle. It's actually a British strap from the 19th century. In, in, in its letter form and that for me typifies the type of equipment the volunteers have they use what they can get to make things work um, now the rifle itself I just have to look and see where it's box going. I have an ammunition box somewhere guys with loads of bullets in it ah well hidden back to the real stuff which happened of course in history it's what we expect isn't it that's what I should have said. Okay, so here we are. Do you remember these bullets from earlier on? Hanging from our 1882 bandolier. Well, here's one, fully in the flesh. Now, this was a single shot weapon. There's no magazine. So you're talking about one shot per go. And um, it was slow going. You had to push each round into the chamber. You fire, pull back the bolt. And then instead of having a spring here to expel the last shell, you actually turn the gun on its side and give it a shake. How many RTE programs do that? 
So that's what you had to do. So it's quite cumbersome. You might still think, oh, I could get 12 shots off a minute. Yeah? Well, now I'm going to tell you the next bit of bad news. See this barrel here? It gets very hot. Why? Because our bullet is using old-fashioned fa black powder, old-fashioned stuff. It heats the barrel up very, very hot. And if you shot off more than four or, or definitely five bullets a minute, it's going to overheat. And you won't be able to handle or use the gun anymore because the, the steel contracts, of course. That's a bit of science for you there. The British accused the Irish volunteers of um, using dum-dum rounds. Now, dum-dum rounds are when you incise an X at the top of the bullet, which makes the bullet expand even more inside the body, causing a horrible, grievous exit wound. However, old-fashioned bullets like this with lead heads will cause that anyway, so I think it's quite likely that dum-dum rounds weren't used, but I can see where the British are coming from, from that point of view. So, that's the Hoth Mauser, one of the most iconic um, weapons in Irish history, I would rank it alongside with what I call the Holy Trinity of Irish weapons, which includes the 7098 Pike and the Irish Gaelic Ringsword from medieval times. Those three weapons for me um, are the three most iconic. There's other contenders, of course, but maybe we'll have to do a talk just about that sometime. This one, by the way, this particular weapon was made in 1881. The date is just written right there. So, and um, the last ones were made in 1884. So it was a run of about, what, 13 years? So we'll just put that one down. These are the sights here, by the way. So they're movable, you have solid sights at the front. There was no bayonets provided for them, by the way, um, unfortunately, when Erskine Childers and Mary Spring Rice came over with the weapons. Mary Spring Rice, a great woman of Limerick. So the, what the volunteers did was they found the, one of the old French bayonets, an old 19th century style of bayonet, was the closest match. And with a bit of fighting, maybe a bit of welding, you know, in the basement of Liberty Hall, you could kind of make it fit, the Hoth Mauser, all right? So, beautiful thing this, by the way, lovely work in, in the French blades. And it's a steel sheath, kind of old-fashioned, you know? You'll you probably have a leather one in the 20th century. So that's the Hoth Mauser, and the only other rifle I'm going to show you today is this one, which is... SMLE rifle or the Lee Enfield rifle. These ones, there's a long line of Enfield rifles that were used uh, by the British over the years. This one here is one of the best rifles uh, used in the war. Um, we'll just get a clip of ammo just to show you how it works. It's supposed to show, isn't it? You can't be ready for everything. So I'll just sling it over in the casual manner such slings were worn. And so, what have you got? Materials wise, you've got a canvas um, strap, an indication to me that it's a Commonwealth rifle in the first place. You have a little hatch at the back, the brass plate here. That was used to keep a little oil vial, so you could oil the weapon and maintain it. Very important that each soldier would do that for himself. The rest of the weapon is made of wood, it weighs about four kilos, so it's slightly lighter than the Hoth Mauser, which weighs um, four and a half kilos, and apparently, you know, volunteers would appreciate that little half kilo difference, by the way, in first-hand accounts, you can see that. The rest of the material, of course, is steel, iron, and apart from the magazine. Now, the magazine is made of aluminium, very light. Ostensibly, it's disposable, but you're not going to get another one in the British Army. I'm just going to give you one, because it's expensive enough to re replace, and the other thing was the Lee Enfield could be fired quite quickly. You could fire off 20 to 25 shots in a minute, British Army doesn't necessarily want that, they might want you just to look at what you're doing, you know, take your time and, and do a name shot. So for that reason, it was actually loaded, um, not from not from the magazine, you know, pre-loaded, as, as you might imagine, which could hold up to 10 rounds, by the way, but rather from the stripper clip. So if you have a look here, you can see there's a little groove right there, and you see our stripper. The stripper actually fits nice and tidy in there, isn't that fantastic? So. You've got your five rounds, you press them down with your thumb, and then if you wanted to, you would put another five rounds in, because this magazine is one of the only you know, magazines in World War I that holds ten rounds. You know, the German standard French rifle, standard Russian rifle, they're all five rounds each, so this is one big advantage that the British had in World War I, and a fantastic rifle uh, that the IRA, of course, would have been you know, very glad to get their hands on. Um, however, there's one little caveat here. If you do put in 10 bullets, or even 9, there was a chance that the gun could jam. 
So apparently it was better to put in eight as a maximum. So what you would do is you put in five, shoot off a couple, and then put in another five. That was the safest way to go about it. All right. Effective range of this weapon, about 500 yards, 500 meters. Um, same with the Hoth Mauser, so effective range. But this weapon uses cordite powder. Far better for your sniper. And James Connolly and Pierce and others who you know, allocated who was sniping who wasn't, they would ensure that they had the best rifles. The volunteers didn't have a lot of these rifles, but Michael Mallon, for example, lived at the back of Richmond Barracks, and apparently friendly hands would sometimes emerge over the walls bearing weapons like this for his cause. So that's how uh, the volunteers got a small number of them. It's hard to estimate how many they had, but it was probably in two digits rather than three. Let's put it that way. There's also a small little feature here you only see on earlier um, SMLE rifles, and that's called a cut-off lever. So just push it in. The cut-off lever means you can just chamber one round, which was handy for police forces. Okay, you don't need to actually have the magazine then. Handy for deer hunters too now, by the way. So that's the bolt. Lock it down. And um, you have a safety there. And that's how it works. You have um, a rear sight that is calibrated to 2,000 meters. And you have a solid sight at the front. The little look at the bottom here is designed for a bayonet. And of course, this was every soldier's dread, was that he'd hear that whistle and be told to go over the top. And if you did get to the other side, well, what exactly were you going to do with this? And what were they going to do to you? Don't think too much, just do it. So, little button here, spring loaded, press it in, and you can push your bayonet down. That's what the little snub at the top is for, it's just for the ring of the bayonet. This is a 1907 original bayonet that goes with the rifle, and it's a very nice fit overall. Another thing to do with World War I, that was equally miserable anyway at least, was the mud, and of course, mechanisms have to be protected. So this was a little hood that was used in World War I, to cover um, the working parts of the gun in those awful, awful conditions. So that's um, the Lee Enfield rifle introduction to it at least. And now we'll just look at a few more weapons to wrap things up. Another weapon used by the British in the Rising was one of their most cutting edge weapons at that time. It was um, it's called a Middlesbrough. Uh, this one is Mark V, it's one of the earlier ones. There were certain developments in, in Mills bombs over time. You may think it's a fragmentation grenade, but actually those grooves are not designed for fragmentation. That's an idea that comes in soon after though. The idea was that these guys, their hands are covered in muck, and this is to facilitate grip. Now, at first, when these Mills grenades were distributed to the troops, they had a seven, seven second delay. And the way it worked was, was that you would press that lever in, you would pull out, you know, what looks like a key ring, a wire, a retaining wire, and then you would throw it. Now, obviously, if you throw it, you're letting go of the lever, aren't you? And that's what sets off the detonator. And you had seven seconds. It's quite a long time, isn't it? Fritz is having a look at that going, fancy my chances. Yep, and I don't fancy my chances hanging around here otherwise. So they changed it to four seconds later on in the war. Okay, kind of makes sense, doesn't it? One of the weapons used um, in the Easter Rising by the Sherwood Foresters, Knotts and Derby Regiment, was these weapons. Um, they were frustrated after losing so many men on the street, after being ambushed, and they didn't know it. They thought they were ambushed by a much bigger number, by only 17 men altogether in three buildings, including Michael Malone, the second lieutenant we mentioned earlier on. Eventually, they would break down the door that, of the house um, that Malone was in, 25 Northumberland Road, and these Mills bombs played a big role in that, and they also played a big role in other areas in, on that battlefield later on and helped them um, finally suppress the small Irish um, group that was there. Michael Malone himself, by the way, was killed as he came halfway down the stairs uh, in a burst of rifle fire. James Grace, his close comrade who had a long Lee Enfield rifle, uh, managed to escape and hide in someone's back garden for a while, but he was later captured. He was the one who later identified Michael Malone's body, and that's when that left sleeve was taken, and now you can view it in Collins Barracks Museum today. So there you go. Mills bomb, um, very effective grenade for the time, has to be said. Just show you some more weapons of the time. I could have added this into the top tree, maybe. It's another German weapon. It's made by the same Mauser company who made the Holt Mauser rifle. But this is a more advanced weapon. Um, the date on this is, you know, 
probably about 1913, 1914. It's very hard to work out the date of this type of weapon now because after World War II, the Mauser factory was ransacked. The Americans blamed the French. I think the French blamed the Americans. I'm not sure who did it, but we don't have the records anymore. Wooden holster is a bit odd, isn't it? But there is a reason, of course. There's a little button there, spring loaded. We open it up, take out the pistol. It's a little groove right there, if you can see that. There's a little groove at the back of the gun. And the two have a rather snug relationship, let's put it that way. Clips in. So instead of having a pistol, a pretty good pistol, by the way, that has a range of 75 meters on its own, you now have effectively submachine gun, carbine, call it what you will. And it's much more stable. That stability allows you to have a range well in excess of 200 meters. The advertisers of the time tell us that this gun had the power to pierce a man's arm from 300 meters. And I've even heard claims that the weapon was fairly effective up to 900 meters. But, you know, this is Ireland. There's only limited experimentation that we can do, shall we say. So, if you look closely, you can just see the maker's mark there. I think it says Mauser Fabric, so Mauser Factory. And although this gun um, shoots quickly, it doesn't have separate magazines. I'll show you what it has. What we're using is a stripper clip, a bit like the Lee Enfield rifle. And where do they go, you may, may ask? It's a, it's a damn good question. That's the safety. So when you take the safety off, you can pull back the action and you can slide. Again, you have the stripper clip and you have the receiver bit here. And that's how it works. You actually press those down with your thumb and they fit into the integral magazine of the gun in kind of a zigzag shape, if you will. For the nerds, these are 7.63 millimeter bullets. They're regarded as high velocity and um, very effective. Uh, that taper towards the top apparently added to the effect of the gunpowder in the gun. That's the actual number of the gun on the top there. So very effective weapon, very expensive weapon. A sort of weapon that Michael Malone couldn't afford and never happened. The gun he was using was Eamon de Valera's gun. Later on, after independence, the British actually gave the gun back to Ireland and the gun is now in the museum in Dublin as well, out here. Other famous users of the C96 pistols, nicknamed Peter the Painter and often called a Greenhander handle pistol, Greenhander Mauser by directors because of its you know, round section grip, include both Fourth Battalion leaders, um, Eamon Kant and Carl Brewer, who had a very famous gunfight. Kant had one, had one of his own too, by the way. Um, Pierce had one. Markovic famously had one at the end of the rising, kissed hers, and handed it over before she handed over her arm. Okay. So, I'll tell you what not to do with a mouser without saying it. Okay, you ready? Just don't do it. I know it's It's not good, is it? Take it back on and um, just dry fire. And take it back on. Go back to the wooden box. And uh, fit it in there. It's a nice cozy fit, but you have a spring at the top of the box there. When you close it over, it's not too much of a rattle. Not too bad. The leatherwork is also original. Um, you can see there the date. 1916. That's the date we're looking for, isn't it? Um, the earlier, the better. So it's a fair in mark. And uh, when I got it, it was in very poor condition and was missing its retaining uh, strap. So I had to make that myself. I tried to make it match the rest of the piece. Originally, there would have also been a cleaning rod attached to the left here as well to keep it maintained. This is the sort of weapon that in German army service was used by artillery crews in particular and also by pilots uh, for their own personal protection. The shorter Luger with its shorter range was regarded as, you know, too short a range for their protection and the rifle was too heavy to carry. So this was a good compromise between the two. Apparently it could shoot off five shots in a second, it was that fast, but of course you had to keep changing those stripper clips. That was uh, the issue at hand. Now there was alternatives for the Irish volunteer also, and for the German army as it happens. And that was the pistol known as the Parabellum pistol or the POH pistol, so named the POH because it entered German army service in 1908. It was invented by a Swiss inventor called George Luger, and often people refer to these guns as Lugers today. Their holsters are almost works of art in themselves, you know, hard leather, beautifully shaped. I'll just take it up there. There's a little pouch there, and a little pouch 
retains a little tool that was this tool alone is all you need to strip the gun down and to put it back together again so that was very self-contained this pistol here has a lanyard lanyard was often used by both the British and you know, German armies and other armies in World War One, especially for trench raiding so you didn't lose your pistol in the dark of the fighting very important a lot of this fighting happened at night time in particular and even during daytime you don't want your pistol falling into you know a swamp of muck Early uses of this pistol include um, Richard, Richard Mulcahy, who fought at Ashburn in 1916, and he retained one even into his Free State service later on. Um, it's a very iconic weapon and very, very collectible, and therefore they still fetch pretty good prices on the markets along with their C96 cousins. Um, this one here has a date of 1911. You can just see the date there on top, so there's no ambiguity with the dates of these guns as there is with the Mauser, so they're easier that way. The magazine is removable, it's made of aluminium. World War I ones have walnut on the base, whereas World War II ones have Bakelite, usually in black. And that's the magazine there. Empty, you'd be glad to hear. The magazine held eight rounds, and you could have a ninth round in the chamber. So you could hold nine rounds in this gun all together, so almost as good as the C96. Not as accurate though, probably effective, uh, you, you could put an effective range of some 50 metres on it. Just place the manufacturer as well, it's just written there. So this was one of only two factories that were making these pistols in you know, our insurgency period. Um, one was Erfurt and the other one was DWM, the two companies who produced Lugers. There was a lot more um, companies producing Lugers later on, including the famous Mauser company that made the C96. Like all guns from this time, it usually has blued steel protected from rust as well, by the way, and these guns had to be constantly maintained. The Luger in particular had a reputation for jamming. Keep it clean, no problem, but you really have to be very, very strict about that, you know? Keep it, keep it well. In World War II, of course, it's well known that American soldiers in particular love to grab one of these to bring home to the US as the ultimate memento of having served in the European theater of operations. Um, unlike the Mauser, there is no movable rear sight. You probably don't need it. It's a fixed sight at the back and you have a front fin at the front. So that's how it was fired. So there you go, that's the Luger for you. And it's case. The case, by the way, also had um, a small pouch on its side so you could put in a spare. Um, oh, that one's full. Oh dear. Tony joking. They're all inert, of course. You knew that anyway, didn't you? So we'll just patch it all up. Obviously, if you're in the combat zone, you're not going to be buckling this up. You saw how long it took me to undo it. So I'll just tidy it up now anyway. I used to use an original holster, but I got this replica one and kind of aged it down a bit because I I think the original one needs to be preserved. And that's it. That's the Luger for you. Now, there was a second version of Luger that we won't go into in any great detail, but it is important because Dan Breen used one in the um, War of Independence. And Sean Tracy, who was shot on Talbot Street in Dublin, famously from Tipperary, also had one of these. And his one is on display in the National Museum in Collins Barracks, if you want to see it. Um, other volunteers also use this weapon. It's probably one of the most desirable weapons for a volunteer to have. It's basically the same as the Luger, but it comes in a much bigger holster for a good reason. Again, you have your, your tool at the top there. Um, put into the pouch. There's a toggle here, because this weapon's actually difficult to get out quickly. And you pull the toggle, and that helps you take it out. Now, the barrel on this gun is eight inches long, whereas a normal Luger is around four inches long, okay? So. Therefore, this type of Luger, in terms of range, had more or less the same properties as the C96 Mauser and was also used by art artillery crews and pilots for the same reason. So that's that one there, I'll just to button her up again. You'll see at the back, the Luger, the artillery Luger also has a stock and the stock you know, was designed for the same purpose that the stock for the C96 was. The only difference is that the stock for the Luger is much flatter. It's just a flat piece of uh, walnut timber there. It would click in in the same way though as our C96. So in some ways it was more convenient, in some ways not. And often if you're using these, you may as well just keep the holster together and, and use it like that, you know. You can just drop this piece off, you see, 
and then you can have access to the grooves for attachment. Um, I said I wouldn't talk about this one for too long. Anyway, I just have to see the cleaning tool, so I may as well show it to you because I have one for this one, and that's it there. It's just a rod with a wooden handle there, okay? So you can maintain the weapon in the field, that's the whole idea. And make sure, especially with lubers, that you maintain them, it's very important. Okay, just to have some of the British weapons. The British weapons, of course, like the Lee Enfield rifle, were used by both sides in the Irish War of Independence. As a general rule in the British Army, the holster with the flap was an officer's holster. The open holster was an ordinary man's holster, such as a machine gunner. Sometimes the RIC used Webleys as well. Um, Colts and other pistols were also used, of course, as well as Smith and Wessons. This one here is um, a famous type of gun. It's um, known as the Mark VI Webley. Very heavy gun. Um, weighed almost as much as this one here, just over a kilo. Um, that one is about 1.3 kilos, I think, so there's not much in the difference, really. Quite a long barrel. Um, effective range, about the same as the Luger, about 50 yards, 50 meters, around that type of length. Um, it was a broke back pistol, so what happened was, every time you fired it, and uh, catch this now on camera, this is worth looking at. You break it back, the, the, the cartridges are spent. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Pull that back, and that's what happens, okay? So, you ready? They're disposable. It's 1916 again, okay? Now, just to show you the type of ammunition these pistols were using. That's what we call 45 ammunition, and the Webley Mark VI, which came in in 1915 for the British Army, was using this ammunition. This would hit you hard. You know, this is a man stopper, as they call it, you know? Um, six of those obviously could be loaded at one time, so not as good as the Luger from that point of view, but very robust um, and not cl not, not prone to the same amount you know, of jamming as some of the German semi-automatics um, were, were prone to. You can see up close there it says Webley and Mark VI written on the top there. So even if you don't know, you can read it. Makes it easier, doesn't it? So I'm going to put that back into its brown British Army service holster. And we'll just have a look at a slightly smaller version that was often seen in police service. It's known as the Boer uh, Webley because it was used in the Boer campaign at the end of the 19th, going into the early 20th century, and that's the Mark IV. So it's a bit smaller, a bit lighter, and its round was a 38. Now, when we say 38 and 45 with British weapons, what we're talking about is 0.45 of an inch, 0.38 of an inch. So the 38 was a slightly smaller round, but um, doesn't mean you want to get hit by one. This is an original black holster, so may well have been an original one used by the RIC or the Oxys back in the day. A little cleaning rod at the back there, so it's quite quite a tidy job, really. Now, before all these weapons came into the hands of the volunteers, drill was often committed with this, what's known as the Tipperary rifle. And um, you see photographs even of the volunteers in their early days, you know, doing their drill with this, well, it is a weapon too, isn't it? And you don't want to mess with Con Colbert when he's running after you on the street with one of these. So that's the form that the hurl took in those days, slightly different to the modern hurl. And I don't think, if you go back even to Coo Holland's time and the earliest days of hurling, that the hurl changed much before that. And it's always constantly evolving. And even today we have issues with ash dieback disease and we're wondering where that's going to take us, you know, do we have to go the same route as baseball and deal with maple or sycamore? Surely not. So hopefully anyway, our Irish stock of ash trees ride that one out but a very iconic item from so many points of view and along with skipping I recommend it for exercise as well okay I'm going to round off with one more weapon this is an original pike the date probably from the Fenian uprising of the mid 19th century some of them however were still used in the 1916 rising in fact, the Kimmage garrison made some specially for the purpose. Um, one of the volunteers in the GPO garrison, Michael Knightley, of the 1st Battalion F Company, claimed that he felt more comfortable at his station at a GPO window with one of these than with a gun. I don't think he was too fond of guns, and in a way, as a medievalist, I know where he's coming from. The hook in these old weapons was designed to cut down cavalry, to break their harness, and of course, you know what the spear does. Back in 1798, the haft would have been longer, 
but given that this is an original haft, I'm not going to change it. So I just thought you might like to see something a bit more archaic to round off our 1916 weapons. Just as a postscript, and you can take some shots of the bayonets there as well. At the end of the Easter Rising, ordinary British soldiers who were dealing and processing with the weapons the volunteers used, and the citizen army as well, and coming them on, were amazed at the, you know, the, the eclecticness of it all. It's not like any ordinary army, the amount of stuff that was used. You have Italian bayonets, you had French bayonets, German bayonets, British bayonets, countries from nearly, you know, equipment from nearly every country in Europe. So it was bewildering, and some of the photographs that, that were taken at the time are incredible inspiration. And I, I actually use that inspiration just to build up this, this collection to some degree. So just to round off, I just want to say thanks very much for spending so much time with me today. I hope you enjoyed the talk. I hope it was a good introduction, probably a bit more than an introduction in some ways. But um, I want to thank Athlone Castle in particular for hosting this event today. And also, we're very grateful for the support of National Heritage Week and the Irish Wall Towns Network, all working under the auspices of our hard working, in difficult circumstances these days, the Heritage Council. Thank you very much. August Slán, August Bannacht.